Good morning, fellow mathematicians. As you can see, things are a little different now. My setting has changed. My accent has changed. I'm American. Amazing. Obviously, I'm kidding. My name is Sam. I run the YouTube channel, what the heck? Tugon. I'm a recent college graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. I do videos on high school sort of lessons or secondary school, if that's your preference. Trigonometry, exponentiation, complex numbers, some calculus. And I often go off on these little tangents where I explore kind of more complex mathematical ideas just for the sake of my own entertainment. Like I did a response to Dr. Payam about uh, product calculus. I've done wacky integral videos, which I'm going to continue doing. And all around, I just enjoy doing mathematics, and so I like sharing that appreciation with the people that watch my videos. So I would very much appreciate it if those watching could perhaps go view a few of my videos, subscribe, like a bunch of them if you if you do enjoy them. I try to do my best in my explanations, and I, and I think I do a pretty good job, and I would really appreciate it if you would check them out. Like I said, I've done responses to the kings of the, of the mathematical YouTube world at this point. Uh, that would be you know, Dr. Payam, Black Pen, Red Pen, and of course, Flammable Maths, who is being an incredibly gracious host to me, allowing me to be a part of his Complex Numbers But Different series and hosting this on his channel. Now I'm going to do what our good friend Jens wants us to do. In this video, I'm going to use what he's been able to show as the matrix representation of complex numbers. I'm going to use that to show that the angle sum formulas for trigonometric functions do still hold. And there's actually a nice shortcut that you can use through this matrix representation that you will see when I've completed it. So let's do some math. So in this video, we'll be covering, as I said, the angle sum formulas for trigonometric functions using the matrix form of complex numbers that our good friend Flammable Maths has been doing in his complex numbers but different series. And just to sort of give a quick recap, we have certain things that we should remember. We have the identity matrix, which is represented by this fancy one that is equal to, in the two by two sense, equal to the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. If you multiply this matrix by any matrix with two rows, you will get back to that same matrix, because that's how matrix multiplication is defined. We also have this other matrix. You could almost call it the imaginary identity, but it's it's not quite an identity, but it's, it's, it's the representation of I as a 2 by 2 matrix. And this matrix is equal to 0, negative 1, 1, 0, which if you recall, is equal to the negative of its inverse, right? Which makes sense if we recall basic imaginary number facts, right? 1 over i is equal to negative i. So the fact that that's reflected through the matrix representation is very good, and it's also equal to the negative of its transpose, which is really easy to see because when you transpose this matrix, you end up with 0, 1, negative 1, 0, which is the negative of that. And remember, the transpose is when you reflect the matrix about its main diagonal. So these three facts are sort of what we know so far. Um, again, these are the 2 by 2 representations. And we understand that if we have some imaginary number A plus BI as just a quantity and we want to represent it in these matrix forms, we can sort of transition this into the matrix form by saying it's A times the identity matrix plus B times the imaginary matrix, right? And this is sort of our way of representing them in the matrix form. Uh, usually we denote them with capital letters just for the sake of sticking with the uh, convention of capital letters being associated with matrices. Um, and so this is our way of representing them. And if you've seen my series on Euler's formula, or you know anything about Euler's formula, we know that in the context of just complex numbers themselves, that e to the i times some angle, uh, we'll guess, I guess we'll say, what letter should we use? Uh, let's say alpha, that we get the cosine of alpha plus i times the sine of alpha. And that's just Euler's formula, right? I did a video on, I did a video series and I'm still doing a video series that proves this and explores the properties of it. And if you're interested, hopefully that will be linked up in the top corner. Um, but because we have an imaginary number in the exponent here and a complex number expression here, we can transform this into the matrix representation presented in complex numbers but different. So because this is a purely imaginary number in the exponent, we can sort of transition this into, uh, and I'm going to go, I'm going to write exp for exponent instead of e to the something so that I don't have to write a really tiny matrix. So we get the exponent, the e of, um, 
what are we going to have? We're going to get alpha times the imaginary matrix, right, in the exponent. And we're going to have the cosine of alpha times the identity matrix, right, plus the sine of alpha times the imaginary matrix. Because that's, I'm sort of tran transitioning from this normal uh, real number way of writing it into the matrix world that we've been sort of seeing unfold before us in this series. So now we can sort of rewrite these in terms of those matrices. So I'm going to erase everything and rewrite this up there. So because we know that Euler's formula is true, we can express it in this matrix form where we have the exponent of um, some number alpha times the imaginary matrix which is equal to the cosine of alpha times the identity matrix, which is uh, plus the sine of alpha times the imaginary matrix. That's just what I'm going to call it. It's obviously still constructed by a two by two grid of real numbers, but I'm just gonna call that for the sake of brevity, the imaginary matrix. So what we can do is we can rewrite this now, right? We have the exponent or, or E of, and what, what, is, what is alpha times the imaginary matrix? Uh, matrix. Well, the imaginary matrix is again 0, negative 1, 1, 0. So this will become E of this matrix here. So uh, it will be 0, negative alpha, alpha, 0, right? Because this is a purely imaginary number because it's some real number times i. So this is a purely imaginary number, and so you only see entries in the slots that appear in the imaginary um, matrix. And so now we're just going to fill these out. Cosine of alpha times the identity matrix is going to give cosine of alpha, 0, 0, cosine of alpha, plus sine of alpha times the imaginary matrix is going to give 0, negative sine of alpha, sine of alpha, 0. Naturally, we can just combine these two things together to give ourselves the single matrix form of a complex number. So we get that this is equal to the cosine of alpha minus sine of alpha, sine of alpha, cosine of alpha. Because, of course, we can simply add up matrices pointwise. Um, so this is the relationship of Euler's formula written in this complex numbers but different matrix form. So we have E of the matrix 0, negative alpha, alpha 0 is equal to the matrix cosine of alpha, negative sine of alpha, sine of alpha, cosine of alpha. And naturally, this still holds the form of the complex number matrix, right? We've got that the main diagonal has the same terms, and we've got that the not-so-main diagonal has negative terms of each other, where this one is, if this one is automatically negative from the start, then this one is positive, and had we chosen the other way, they would simply be flipped. But remember, if you flip the negatives, that's now, by our own definition, uh, multiplying by the negative of the imaginary matrix. So we're sticking with the convention that we've just that has been presented throughout this series, where this term is the negative one and this term is the positive one. And in my video on Euler's formula, we explored what it was when you do e to the i of alpha plus beta. So two different angles, right? And because this can be written as e to the i alpha times e to the i beta using the rules of exponents, we can say, see that this is going to be the same as the cosine of alpha plus beta plus i times the sine of alpha plus beta. But because we can also write it like this, it's also equal to the cosine of alpha plus i times the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta plus i times the sine of beta. And when you FOIL this thing out and set the real parts of this equal to this real part and the imaginary parts of this equal to this imaginary part, you see that you end up with the expressions for the angle sum formula for cosine and the angle sum formula for sine in the respective real and imaginary parts, which is very, very lovely because it now that means that this proves that it works for every alpha and beta, not just those real numbers between 0 and pi over 2. So we're going to use the fact that this is true to show that it works with the matrix representations now. So imagine for a second that we had um, the, the matrix representation of that, a product of two uh, examples of Euler's formula. So we have the e to the uh, 0, negative alpha, alpha 0, times e to the 0, negative beta, beta 0. So this is exactly saying e to the i alpha times e to the i beta, which if we use the rule of exponents means we can write 
e to the sum of those two things, and when we add them, you'll see that we'll just get those inputs as we did in the regular exponent form that we're used to. So we get e of 0, negative alpha plus beta, because we're summing negative alpha and negative beta, so we should get the negative of their sum there. And now we just sum alpha and beta. 0 plus 0 is again 0. And so this is the expression that we're going to solve, which is identical to e to the i alpha plus beta, right? This is what that means. This is how we can write it in matrix form as opposed to the regular exponent form. And given that we are multiplying uh, the expression cosine of alpha plus i sine of alpha times cosine of beta plus i sine of beta, we can literally multiply those two matrices together. So this is going to be equal to the cosine of alpha minus sine of alpha sine of alpha cosine of alpha, right? This is that thing right there. And since we're directly multiplying, we can say we're multiplying by the cosine of beta minus sine of beta, sine of beta, cosine of alpha, right? So these, whoops, cosine of beta. So these are, this right here is exactly this thing. And this matrix here is exactly this matrix here. These are simply the translation, the, uh, the transformations from regular old Euler's formula equaling cosine of something plus i times the sine of something to the matrix form that's been introduced in this series. And so just as you do with any other matrix when you're multiplying, we're going to use matrix multiplication, which is simply, uh, the, as it's defined, you multiply each row by each column individually, and we're going to end up with another two by two matrix. And you'll see that we actually don't have to do all the work that we're going to end up doing, but I'll show it to you anyway. Uh, just to show that this does in fact stay closed under multiplication even though we sort of already know that it does. So by the definition of matrix multiplication, we're simply going to multiply these two things together and add it to the product of those two things. So the first part of the first term is going to be cosine of alpha times cosine of beta. I'm going to need more room. <clears throat> minus sine of alpha times the sine of beta, right? And the second, the second input or uh, element of the, or entry as you might want to call it, of the matrix is going to be negative cosine of alpha times sine of beta minus sine of alpha cosine of beta. And the third entry is going to be sine of alpha times the cosine of beta plus the cosine of alpha times the sine of beta. And the final entry is going to be negative sine alpha sine of beta uh, plus cosine of alpha cosine of beta. Close that off. And what you can see is what we have is simply the angle sum formula for the cosine, the angle sum formula for the sine, the negative of the angle sum formula for the sine, and if you simply flip these terms, you'll end up again with the angle sum formula for the cosine. So this is equal to the matrix cosine of alpha plus beta, negative sine of alpha plus beta, sine of alpha plus beta, cosine of alpha plus beta. So as you can see, this does exactly what we wanted it to do. We took Euler's formula, multiplied the same thing with two different inputs as you would when you uh, do it with the regular expon exponential and complex number form. We multiplied those matrices together and we ended up with exactly what we wanted to find. We found the angle sum formula for the cosine and the angle sum formula for the sine. As you can see, you really only need the first column of this matrix because the other column is just sort of there to demonstrate that you do actually end up with the same form of a complex number where you have the the same entry on the main diagonal and negative entries on the not so main diagonal which is exactly what we have here right cosine of alpha plus beta appears in both entries on the main diagonal and sine and negative sine of alpha plus beta appear in the not so main diagonal um, as the two entries of that <clears throat> So how you could do this shortcut is you simply wouldn't need to include this column of the matrix. You could just exclude it because you don't need this to actually solve the problem. These don't add anything to it. You know it's going to end up being the same because the first column of the resulting matrix is exactly what we want it to be. It's just this column here. So theoretically, you could ignore that column altogether and treat this as a uh, two by one matrix that you're multiplying by and you would get the exact same answer and it would be just as well defined. It clearly demonstrates that we get the angle sum formulas and there they are. It's a lovely piece of mathematics and it's not too hard to see that if we did minus beta instead, which means this would become positive and this would become minus, 
right? That we would have <coughs> positive sign there and negative sign there. Working out the math, and, and, and minus sign there, working out the math, we would see that we'd get a plus here and a minus here, which means we would have evaluated the cosine of alpha minus beta and the sine of alpha minus beta. So it's very easy to see that those things would have come through the math. And of course, naturally, if we redid this whole process with two times alpha, so we had, again, negative alpha here, well, we'd end up again with the cosine of alpha, sine of alpha, et cetera, et cetera. We'd get exactly what we would expect as our inputs for the angle sum formulas, and we would end up with cosine squared of alpha minus sine squared of alpha, which is, of course, cosine of 2 times alpha, and we would end up with 2 times sine of alpha cosine of alpha, right? Which is exactly the sine of 2 times alpha. So all of the things that you would expect to appear in the math do appear in the math. If you change the sine of the second term, you end up with the angle difference formulas. If you plug the same number in, you end up with the double angle formulas, very, very clear, right? I actually tried to figure out a way of representing the tangent sum formula. And, uh, through this process, and I found it very, very difficult. Uh, I don't actually think there's any nice way of doing it, but perhaps I just didn't look hard enough. Um, so I hope that maybe someone in the audience would be willing to try and figure that out. I certainly gave it uh, a, a, a good shot, and I couldn't seem to think of anything. So we can very, very clearly use this method of of uh, representing complex numbers in terms of matrices to derive the angle sum, angle difference, double angle, triple angle, whatever formulas for the sine and cosine quite easily. And I think that's all I was needed here for today. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that you check out my channel. And remember, it's What the Hectagon. I do lots of math videos. I try to get like three in every week. So if you enjoy my stuff, please go check it out. I really, really appreciate it. And keep watching Flammable Maths. He does an excellent job. More in line with the name of my channel, I would say, have a hectagonal day, whatever the hell that means. I have an Instagram page for the channel. It is at what the hectagon, of course, spelled correctly, unlike my email, right? Hectagon, I spelled in the email with an A here when in fact it's an O. What the hectagon on Instagram. So this is Instagram. I post channel updates there. I also am doing a lot more reading than I used to now, so I'm posting books that I'm reading that I recommend to people. I have a collection of vinyl records that I like to share. Follow me at what the hectagon on Instagram. I'd like to point out that uh, one of my best friends, who is very much into Dungeons and Dragons, has a YouTube channel called Marching West. He does like a little podcast about Dungeons and Dragons. He does Dungeons and Dragons all the time through his Discord server. He's very, very into it, and I'm sure he would appreciate a bit of a mention. So if you're into Dungeons and Dragons, visit his YouTube channel, Marching West. He also has an Instagram account, again, at Marching West. Also, this fellow, Bill and I, are starting a, another YouTube channel. I guess you could call it personal reasons, even though it's just kind of funny. It's called Fredwood Live. On YouTube, we're just called Fredwood. Uh, it's an amalgamation of two different things that uh, were sort of important to us in our college days, um, which are <laughs> getting farther and farther behind us. So this is, again, YouTube. We have a channel called Fredwood. We're going to do kind of silly, just us riffing off of each other vlogs that we edit together in humorous ways. But we're also going to start doing weekly video game streams on Mixer. And on Mixer, our name is Fred Wood Live. So if you want to see two kind of dopey former college students do kind of ridiculous video game streams and also other things that we're going to do on top of that on Mixer, our username is Fred Wood Live, so check us out. Likewise, we have a Twitter account to promote it, also at Fred Wood Live. So I apologize for all of these different promotions. I figured I'd just start putting these out there. So there's a few that I'd like you to check out if you're interested. Is my Instagram account, What the Hectagon. Uh, on YouTube, my buddy Bill's channel, Marching West, it has to do with podcasts and the like relating to Dungeons & Dragons, the Instagram account for channel updates for that channel, our joint channel, Fredwood, where we're going to be posting stream clips and vlogs that we make, which are not in any way intended to be serious. It's all supposed to be just kind of humorous. We are going to stream on Mixer because that's the only way that we can use the camera that we have on my Xbox One, and we're not about to buy a Kinect to do on Twitch. So Mixer, Fredwood Live, and the Twitter account for that is at Fredwood Live. So if you're interested in any of these things, please give us a follow. I really appreciate it.